Right. Hi there, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, we're just going to get started in a moment. Um, but before that, I'm just going to go through a little bit of um, housekeeping stuff. So because this is a, a webinar, um, me and, and my presenter colleague will not be able to see or hear you, unlike the traditional Zoom style meeting. Therefore, if you have any questions um, that you would like directed to the presenter, Hannah, or about MPMS methodology, then please use the Q&A function. Um, and as we go through, I will do my best to answer as many as possible. And um, those that are answered will display for you to be able to see what other people have asked as well. Um, equally, we'll have a little bit of a time at the end for any additional questions to go through. Um, use the chat, obviously, for chat purposes, so to speak to each other if you wish to. Um, I'll be putting some of the relevant links into the chat, so do check on that if, I mention, if they mention anything about links. Um, and if you've got any sort of specific technical problems, um, like for some reason suddenly we drop out and we haven't noticed, or you know, our, our sound turns off, then obviously use chat for that function as well. We're hoping today um, it'll be about an hour and a half, um, and that's to allow for sort of questions at the end, um, but this time may vary, obviously. Um, it's being recorded, so um, this will be available from tomorrow on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so at the moment, I'd just like to introduce my um, presenter for today, our ecologist, Hannah Gibbons. So if Hannah would like to turn on her um, camera and her microphone. Hello, Hannah. You're still on mute, just so you're Thanks. aware. <laughs> the classic. Hi. Hello. You you're right. So, yeah, and we're okay. So thank you so much for doing this for us today. So when you are ready, if you wish to um, start sharing your screen, uh, and I'll, I'll let you know that that's all working, and then I will go off into the distance and answer questions in the background. Okay. Cool. Fingers crossed, it works. Uh, is that working? It is about to. Okay. Yep, we can see it. That's all good. Is that good? That is good. Right. I will cool. It's full on. screen, yeah? Okay, cool. Um, hi, everybody. This is a bit strange. I've not done anything like this before. So I'm just talking to my computer, which is a bit weird, but hopefully you can all hear me. Um, my name is Hannah Gibbons. Um, I currently work part time for the RSPB um, and I work on a project which is called Colour in the Margins and it focuses on the conservation of rare arable plants in England. Um, so I've got quite a lot of information in my brain now about this habitat and um, so therefore I'm hopefully going to try and introduce you to this habitat which is really lovely and hopefully you can go and explore um, the arable fields near you to see what you can find. So I'll just kick off now. So firstly, uh, one of the questions that kind of comes out when I start talking about my job is people are like, what does, what does arable even mean? Um, and the definition of arable um, is the production of crops through cultivation. So the ground's cultivated and then seeds are sown and then the plants are harvested for one reason or another, one purpose or another. Um, so in the UK, we grow quite a lot of um, barley and wheat um, and also we grow forage crops. So the top right hand photograph shows uh, forage beet or forage turnips, um, which is grown for livestock and then the livestock eat that um, those the, the the top part, the leaves, and also the um, the bulbs um, later in the year. So kind of autumn, winter time, they're grazed by sheep usually. Um, but also we grow vegetables um, and also maize is a cereal crop too, um, an arable crop. So we've, we've got quite a lot of different things that we grow in this uh, in the UK um, uh, as an arable crop. Uh, also, it's worth mentioning that 70% of the UK's farmland, but not only this, 25% of the UK is arable. So it's quite a significant um, element of our uh, landscape and definitely worth considering when it comes to wildlife. Um, but another kind of assumption, I guess, is that arable fields are boring and rubbish for, for, for wildlife. Um, and I think quite a lot of people think that, but actually um, this isn't the case and hopefully something I'll keep reiterating as uh, the next hour goes through. So actually, arable plants are the most threatened suite of plants in the UK. 
if you listed um, the, the species, the plant species in the UK from the most rare at the top of the list to the most common at the bottom of the list, and then you color coded them by habitat, you would notice that there's quite a distinctive cluster towards the top, the rarer end of your list um, of plants that are associated with disturbed habitats and arable fields provide um, this kind of disturbance. So a lot of the, the plants that we find in arable fields um, are quite uncommon or they can be. Um, but not only that, um, there's a wide, a wide variety of invertebrates and mammals and birds. They're also associated with this habitat too. So it's not just the plants, but um, a, a wide variety of um, organisms, you know, do actually thrive in this landscape uh, if the conditions are right. Um, now I'll be referring to arable plants as arable plants, but um, they, they have been known as arable weeds. We try not to use the term weed necessarily because um, that kind of gives it a bit of a negative connotation. And actually a lot of these plants that I'll be talking about um, don't actually have a negative impact on the crop. They're quite, um, they're quite vulnerable, I suppose, to herbicides and things, and they're not very competitive. So they're not necessarily very good weeds. Um, so we tend to use the term arable plants. So um, arable plant communities have been affected by changes in management over the last um, well, thousands of years, I suppose, but um, particularly more recently. Um, and we've actually had arable farming in the UK for about 8,000 years. So it's something that is, you know, kind of part of our cultural heritage, I suppose. Um, and as uh, humans migrated from you know, Central Europe into the UK, they brought a lot of these crops with them that they wanted to grow, but also um, plants that they didn't necessarily want. So um, many of the plants that are associated with, that, with arable fields aren't necessarily truly native to the UK, but they've actually been bought here by people and they've been here for thousands of years. And if those plants have been here si um, since before, like the 1500s, they're classified as archaeophytes. Um, and if they've been introduced after the 1500s, they're classified as, as neophytes. And around about the 1500s was when people got a bit kind of better in terms of their technology. Um, and we were able to travel and go and get things and bring them back. And so there's a kind of a cutoff really in terms of what we class um, plants as in the UK. Um, so yeah, we've got quite a lot of um, cultural connection, I suppose, with a lot of these plants um, that are in, in arable fields. Um, so technology is, is obviously changed, um, particularly agricultural technology, and that's made significant changes to the plants that you find in arable field margins and, and, and arable fields. Um, and in the late 1800s, we got much better at cleaning seeds. So prefer, prior to that, we were collecting seeds that we of the plants that we wanted, um, and then we'd keep some and then we'd sow them next year. Um, but we weren't very good at actually cleaning those seeds. So you'd collect the, the plants that you didn't necessarily want in amongst your crop seeds, and then you'd sow them again. So you're inadvertently, I suppose, sowing the plants you don't necessarily want. Um, and when technology got better in the late 1800s, we managed to kind of um, really make a, a difference. And so species such as corn cockle, the species on the top left of the screen, um, and darnel, the grass bottom left, um, were like kind of eradicated almost from our fields and now both of these species are um, very very close to extinction if not extinct um, in the UK as a result of this but interestingly enough uh, William Shakespeare in the 16th century actually um, described both of these as very problematic weeds so you know that's been a real change um, in a few hundred years. Um, since the mid 1900s we've developed very effective chemicals that have um, been able to con control the species that we don't necessarily want in our fields, um, which increases crop productivity. And as you can see from this um, graph, the seed density, so the, the number of seeds essentially in the soil um, in our fields is significantly lower now than, um, than it was um, in the, the early 1900s. Um, and that's largely because we're controlling um, the growth of the plants in fields through the use of herbicides. And that's had a significant effect on the vegetation that you find in these disturbed sites. Um, this is a graph that I got from the DEFRA website, which shows that this change isn't necessarily um, kind of stopped now. Um, and although this graph shows all pesticides applied to crops, not necessarily just um, herbicides, so fungicides, things that um, control fungi, 
um, as well would be included within this graph. But as you can see, um, even since the 19, in, since 1990, the amount of, her, of pesticide use has actually increased significantly. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's almost doubled. And that's just um, in, well, in my lifetime, well, less than my lifetime, but um, so just in the last few decades. Um, Fertilisers also are, um, have been developed since the mid, well, since before the mid 1900s, but um, it, the use of fertilisers and the, effect, the effectiveness of fertilisers um, has been um, increased since the mid 1900s. Um, and fertilisers are used as they tend to really encourage the growth of the crop that you're wanting to grow. So as you can see from this graph, the um, amount of tonnage of uh, yield, so the crop that we want, has increased significantly over time. And this is largely because of the fertilizers that we're applying to the fields. Um, and not only this, but we've got much more competitive crop varieties, um, which also you know, grow really quickly in, um, in the conditions that we're providing for them. Um, however, many of the arable plants, particularly the rarer species, are really quite, I mean, not pathetic, but they're a bit, um, they're a bit, um, they kind of need the open environment. They don't do very well with competition. So they, they don't like it when there's very, very dense vegetation. So that's another reason why um, arable plants aren't necessarily as common as they used to be. Um, there've also been other changes to management, um, generally speaking over the last few hundred years. Um, there's been a general shift in cultivation timings from spring cultivation to an autumn and winter cultivation um, and this affects uh, various species in different ways which I'll talk about in a second. Um, field enlargement so after the second world war um, farmers were encouraged by the government to do lots of things and removing hedgerows was one of those um, things they got money for removing hedgerows um, and as arable plants tend to quite like the margins of where it's a bit more open they um, therefore kind of lost their suitable habitat because the field margins essentially were removed um, by hedgerows being taken out. Um, more recently, so this is something that's occurring now, um, there's a significant push towards minimum tillage rather than ploughing. And that's largely because um, minimum tillage is, is better in terms of um, carbon sequestration within the soil. So that's obviously very apt at the moment. Um, we obviously want to maintain as much carbon in the soil as possible. So obviously there's a push towards minimum tillage. However, unfortunately, that has a negative impact on um, arable plants, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, there's also been a move from mixed farming, so where you would have both animals and um, arable fields in the same holding, and there's move, so there's less smaller mixed farms, and people are moving towards pastoral, so grassland farming or wholly arable farming. Um, so that's more of a recent shift as well. The, the smaller mixed farms tend to be less common nowadays. Um, and there has also been an increase in maize and oilseed rape production. And these tend to be quite intensive. Um, particularly maize requires quite a lot of herbicide um, and fertilizer. So spring cultivation versus autumn and winter cultivation. Um, many seeds tend to germinate in one part of the year. So lots of species germinate in spring and other, other species germinate in autumn. So if you have a spring germinating species and that particular field then starts to be autumn cultivated, it doesn't really do very well in that new situation. So a, a, a movement of cultivation timing does actually make a difference in terms of the arable plants that you might find in a given field. Um, and it's worth also noting that fields and crops that are sown in autumn or winter, so an autumn winter cultivated situation, they tend to be more improved and their fields tend to receive more applications of herbicides. So that in more intensive farming tends to also have a negative impact on the diversity of the arable plants that you might find. So I it's probably worth mentioning what min tillage and ploughing essentially means. So uh, ploughing is very often um, well, means that the soil, usually about a foot of the soil is inverted. It's completely flipped on its head. So you have that movement of soil 
um, within that section of the soil so of the um, the ground and min till tends to be a disturbance but more of a scratching of the surface so it's much less um, soil movement and I suppose that's why the carbon stays locked up in the soil um, but unfortunately min the min till system um, means that grasses can start to dominate on on the field margin um, and also I said as I said before it often requires as, as a result of that I suppose too you more herbicide is used to control the plants that you don't want because you're not managing those plants through disturbance uh, or as much disturbance and this field margin here um, although it wasn't um, actually managed through min tillage does show effectively what would happen. That the, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the, the area of land in, in the foreground um, a year or two before this photograph was taken was a very, very diverse field corner with lots and lots of different species, including one endangered species of arable plant. Um, and this field was not uh, managed through min till was, was direct drilled which is actually even less disturbance so the, the ground isn't disturbed at all and the seeds are inserted directly into the soil and so there's no um, disturbance whatsoever and as you can see this this field corner is now very grass dominated you see lots of Yorkshire fog growing here uh, and, and there was lots of false oak grass too so um, that it has quite significant effect on the vegetation over time. So for all these reasons I've just discussed, you tend to find fewer species rich arable plant communities now than you would have done 50 or 60 years ago, and even less than 100 and 150 years ago. So um, it's these, these particular habitats are actually really quite important. They support lots of rare species, but they're also very, very diverse. Can be very, very diverse. Um, and yeah, many species have become rare or uncommon. So here are a few examples of some species that I've been working on as part of the Colour in the Margins project. Um, one of the species I've been working with, particularly the bottom left is, is small flowered catchfly. And then we've got some red hemp nettle in the top left. Um, and a really interesting species called corn buttercup, which is here bottom right, uh, which is a really nice species. Its other name is Devil's Claw because the seeds have this really spiky, interesting shape. Lots of really the interesting stories as well with these plants because like I said before we've got quite co you know cl um, close cultural significance um, or they have close cultural significance with us because we've been essentially trying to eradicate them from our fields for, the, for hundreds of thousands of years um, so yeah that's corn buttercup which is critically endangered um, in addition to the reduction in species rich margin abundance and also with a reduction in terms of the, a certain number of species that are now uncommon, farmland bird populations have also declined by 56% since the 1970s. And this is actually hand in hand with these changes that I'm talking about in terms of the arable plant communities. Um, these species rely on the seeds that are present over winter, which an arable species rich arable field community can provide, but also many of the fields, the arable fields are very sterile now. And so when there's not very many things, lots of things for insects to eat, eat in those fields, then you have few, fewer insects. And many of these species rely on insects during their um, nesting season because their young uh, are fed um, insects, soft, soft bodied insects usually. So yeah, it's not just the, the fact that arable field margins are uncommon, but actually the, the lots of species that used to rely on them are also uncommon. So this map is quite an interesting one in that it shows, unfortunately for anybody outside of England, it's not very useful because it's just gray. But um, for England, you can see um, which parts of the country tend to be um, good for arable plant um, diversity. And you'll see that there's a kind of central hotspot here and largely in the south. It's worth noting though, that even if the, so red is where it's most, most important for arable plants, I suppose, orange, medium and yellow, not so um, valuable. However, it's worth mentioning, I've been working in South Devon for the last year, three years, and we've got some really species rich um, communities down there. So just because an area is highlighted as yellow, it doesn't mean you're not going to find anything. It's just a, a general pattern. So it's worth noting where you are in the country, if you are in England, um, and you know whether you're in a spot that 
might be worth keeping your eyes peeled for arable plants. Um, so if arable plants are really uncommon, where are the best places to look for them now? Um, so there's different types of management that can be carried out that favours some of these rarer species and these rarer communities. And the first one that I'd like to talk about um, is something that's referred to as a cultivated margin or a cultivated plot. Now, this is one of my favourite margins, actually. It was in South Devon. And it, a cultivated plot involves the, the whole field being ploughed um, and then the outer margin. So in this case, I think it was about four metres wide. You can see the colourful strip with the poppies and the corn marigold in that particular strip was left and it wasn't sown with any crop and it was just left then. It was um, ploughed and then left. And this particular margin is completely rammed full of an endangered species called broad fruited corn salad. Unfortunately, you can't see it because it's quite a small plant, but it is really incredibly abundant and um, a really, really colourful margin, which is essentially what my project is trying to um, kind of aim to achieve, I suppose. Um, now, interestingly, this field was incredibly species poor the year before that. The farmer had managed it fairly um, in a fairly standard way. It was full of the, the crop took up the whole field. It had been sprayed by herbicide and there was very little of interest present. And the year later, when he kind of carried, he did, he was really interested in doing what I'd suggested. And then the following year, there was a riot of colour and insects and a huge number of species, I mean, just, I don't know, 40 or 50 species within quite a small space. So um, that's one of the really exciting thing about arable plant communities is that you can create change and create a real significant change in just a short period of time if the right management is carried out at the right place, which I think is a really, you know, quite an amazing thing. So that's a cultivated margin. You can also get cultivated plots, which are essentially the same management, but you might have it within a middle of a field or on a field edge, but in a plot rather than a strip. And very often these are managed for the benefit of birds, uh, for example, stone curlew. Um, this is an example of a low input um, forage beet crop. Um, so this, so you can get low input crops of any type. And essentially it means little or no fertilizer or herbicide is applied to the, the crop. Um, and in this instance, the farmer just hadn't got round to spraying it and he had meant to. And I was amazed. The number of hoverflies in this field was absolutely incredible. And it is just a sea of fairly common species, but lots and lots of flowers, lots of nectar um, and lots of colour. And, um, and actually, in fact, I hadn't, these species hadn't really significantly outcompeted or you know, um, reduced the productivity of the crop itself. So that can be a good uh, environment for the rarer species to, to grow um, on, on these kind of fields. Organic farms and organic arable fields are some of the best places to look for arable plants because no herbicide is applied, particularly if that, that farm has been organic for a long period of time. Um, so for example, this field here was a spring barley and peas field in Cornwall. And you can see these, um, the cornsbury, these tiny little white flowers that have dotted everywhere. That was completely abundant. And this species is vulnerable in, in the UK. So it was really nice to see it in such quantities. Um, and it looked like a starry sky. It was just incredible. Um, so obviously organic farms are, are pretty good um, because of the, mainly because of a lack of herbicide application. So that can be a really interesting place to look for arable plants. Another management type which benefits uh, the arable plants are cereal headlands. I'm not sure, again, if you can see my cursor, but the, this is a strip of vegetation that heads off into the distance. And essentially it is a spring barley crop that just hasn't been fertilized, hasn't been sprayed with herbicide along this particular strip of the margin. So it's been cultivated with the rest of the field, it's been sown with the rest of the field, but then this particular margin has been left unsprayed. And although there's nothing of particular interest in this field, there's quite a lot of marsh woundwort and there's lots of perennial south thistle. But again, it was full of life and, and lots of things there. In fact, I did a, a rare plant reintroduction along this margin um, a couple of years after this photograph was taken. So cereal headlands can also be really good management for arable plants. 
Now, probably the best places to look in conventional fields or normally, you know, your standard arable field are field corners and field margins. And that's largely because field corners are a bit of an obstacle when people are spraying or putting fertilizer out and they don't tend to be able to get exactly into the corner. And those little corners of those pockets where they've been, where they haven't been sprayed tend to be, you know, full of, full of life. So here's um, a field corner uh, where it was maize crop and it hadn't been sprayed. And there's probably about 10 different species in this photograph. One of which is in, is um, a fumitory, which is the white flowered species in the, well, at the top, um, which is actually endemic to Cornwall, which is called Western Ramping Fumitory. Um, so field corners are a really good place to look. Um, and because arable plants tend to be open growing, they quite like that open environment. The, the corners and the edges are also um, tend to, the vegetation, the, the crop vegetation doesn't tend to do as well. So you, you get a natural edge effect, which the arable plants tend to like. Um, it's also worth noting that fields that are sown with uh, a bird seed mix or a bumble bird mix or some kind of mix that's supposed to be good for pollinators or birds, they can be quite good for arable plants too because they're cultivated, the seeds are sown um, and then they're left and they're not sprayed with herbicide. So um, the yeah, bird seed crops can be also, can be a really good place to look to. I didn't get any, couldn't find any good photographs of any bird seed crops. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of that. So in essence, I think, and lots of other people think, that arable fields can be a real treasure trove. You don't ever really know what you're going to find in a particular field. And that goes from one field to the next on a farm, but it also means when you visit the same field in consecutive years. And that's because um, there are many var variability, var very many um, things that affect what species might grow in a given year. So the weather conditions, so how cold or wet it might have been during the winter, how dry or hot or wet a spring might be. Um, the soil type might change within a field. So you might have a, a slightly sandy corner or a clayey corner, um, and that often dictates what plants might grow. Um, the historical management of a field really affects uh, what might grow um, when you go to survey it for the first time. Um, the cultivation timing has a real significant impact on the vegetation and that obviously changes from one year to the next so that affects the vegetation that might be present at a given site and also the cultivation depth so it's really quite exciting if you re even even if you revisit a field you just don't know what you're going to find and it's you know often really quite exciting when you go somewhere for the first time um, because you just yeah you often don't know what you're going to get and plus arable arable um plants are really under um, recorded so you could come up with something really you know exciting and quite uncommon um, just by taking a look somewhere that you know you wouldn't necessarily have thought of to visit before so I'm going to try and hopefully ensure people don't get too bored um, so a quick question for you before we go on um, can anybody and just um, enter it into the, um, the comment zone um, can you think of or list three reasons as to why um, species rich arable field margins are now uncommon and if you don't want to write it that's fine but um, maybe try and remember um, the th can you think of three reasons as to why species rich arable field margins are now uncommon So we've got a few um, questions and answers coming in for you, Hannah. Oh, cool. Um, Cheers. I can't even uh, see the comments. No, that, so that's I was, fine. I'm just going to leave it for a moment. <laughs> so, uh, larger fields, fewer margins, better yeah. farming practices, larger fields again, chemical yeah. treatment, herbicides, pesticides killing them, loss of seed banks, yeah. fertilizers, seed cleaning, changes in plowing, excessive use of pesticides, fields becoming larger, same yeah. thing seed cleaning, million, minimum till, uh, biocides, modern farming methods, yeah. hedge removal, min till again. Yeah. Obviously, oh. everyone's got the herbicide one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's probably, I'd say that's probably the most significant thing. Yeah. Um, and actually, interestingly, somebody said the re reduction of um, seeds in the seed bank, and that's quite a good one, actually, because that happens over time when management is not suitable. So... 
Um, something I haven't talked about in or haven't wasn't meaning to talk about in this presentation, but it's worth mentioning. And that's the arable seeds, the seeds of arable plants. Some of them last in the seed bank for an incredibly long time. So poppies, I can't, I need to, I meant to do this a while ago, but I forgot. I read something that said that poppies had been excavated through archaeological digs and then they, the seeds were re-sown and they germinated successfully, even though they'd been underground for I don't even know how long it was. It was I think it was thousands of years, um, which is in, like, absolutely incredible. Um, and the, the pattern tends to go that the smaller and rounder or more spherical the seed is, the longer it can last in the seed bank. And the larger and more irregular the seed shape, the shorter that seed lasts in the seed bank. So poppies would probably survive if you didn't treat that field perfect for poppies for quite a long time. But some species need that almost perfect management pretty much every year otherwise they the seeds will eventually run out um, and corn cockle is an example of that that plant that I showed earlier um, and yeah so yeah it, it really does vary in terms of and how that kind of works um, but yeah some of the seeds can last for an incredible amount of time so it's yeah quite an interesting mixture okay um, thank you Hannah I think um, quite everyone's pretty much been listening and paying attention so that's good oh, right. <laughs> carry on <laughs> all right cool <laughs> um cool so hopefully oh no no i can't move my slide ah there we go um so quick mention about the national plant monitoring um scheme survey and how that works for arable field margins so i've been talking about arable fields and cultivated plots and things but um the actual kind of um, priority habitat type so hopefully everybody knows what a priority habitat is but essentially it's a habitat in the UK that is um, has become uncommon and, and um, is threatened and is species rich essentially and the, the habitats that you guys are going to be surveying and monitoring are all priority habitats really um, so the priority habitat for arable for the species rich communities in arable fields is actually classed as arable field margins which is a little bit problematic in some senses, but but it makes your survey quite simple in some respects too. So you, as it's a linear feature, as it's a margin, then you will be monitoring um, plots that are one meter by 25 meter, 25 meters. And on the whole, these plots will extend one meter into the area that's being cropped. So that might be barley or wheat or um, oilseed rape, or root vegetables or whatever the, the crop happens to be. And that might change from one year to the next because the field might be managed on rotation, i.e. the crop might change um, over time. Um, it's important to ignore fields that are not being um, annually cultivated. So perennial crops such as fruit or biofuel don't, don't, work, don't bother about monitoring those fields. Um, obviously, if you've already set up your plot and they happen to put in a biofuel crop for a, a few years, then it's worth monitoring that. And because then hopefully it'll come back into um, be a, a cereal crop or something again. So um, that's worth bearing in mind too. Um, but yeah, the rotation element of management is, could be a little bit disconcerting, but um, I've talked to Sarah about this and we think that you should keep monitoring a plot, even if it isn't arable, for up to five years, because it, if, a, if a grassland field, for example, has been in place for five years, then the likelihood is it will probably be maintained as a, as a grassland field, um, in which case you might want to then rethink about um, setting up a different plot. But up until five years, keep going with the original plot that you've um, come up with, because the likelihood is it will probably go back into arable, um, yeah, but due to the rotation element. So this image is from the information that you get sent out with your pack um, and it highlights that sometimes you might have a permanent strip that's been sown with a pollinator crop. So like I was mentioning a bird seed mix or a bumblebird mix or something, you might have that sown in a, as a linear strip adjacent to your cereal crop and adjacent to the field boundary. So don't, um, it's important to note that that particular sown strip shouldn't be included within your uh, monitoring plot, but your monitoring plot should extend out into the crop. 
if however you you know so you've spoken to the farmer or the landowner and you know that there's a cultivated clock um, a cultivated margin for example adjacent to your crop and that comprises of species that have come up naturally from the seed bank so that photo that I showed earlier with the poppies and the corn marigold in you could you could potentially monitor that strip because that is a naturally occurring um, arable plant community um, but I'd probably only do that if I were you if you know for sure that it hasn't been sown so it's worth if you uh, make contact with the um, farmer or, or manager um, you you find out what you know what the management uh, what management has been carried out but generally speaking you probably won't come across any of these things and it'll probably be, probably be a standard arable field and in which case you just put your um, plot um, along the edge of the ar arable field and then it extends into the field by one meter which hopefully is demonstrated by this image here so you this is that kind of um, those hatched dotted lines show you where you'd put your um, plot. In this case, it might be that this strip is actually a cultivated strip. I think it probably is, um, in which case you could actually monitor that cultivated strip. But um, in a, but if, if you're not sure, then just stick it straight in on the edge of the crop and, and monitor that instead. Um, in terms of where to locate it within your one kilometre grid square, um, ideally, the plot would start at one of the grid lines and extend into one of the grid squares by 25 metres. That's the perfect scenario, but obviously that might not necessarily be practical. It might not, it might not work like that, depending on where your field is in relation to your grid squares. The second best option is for your one by 25 metre plot to cross a grid line if that can happen. But again, that might not be possible. And if that isn't possible, then it's recommended that you put your uh, one by 25 meter plot somewhere else within one of the grid squares, but that you're making sure that the plot that you're um, surveying is very representative of the vegetation that you're trying to monitor. So that's quite important and quite important. Don't necessarily pick the really species rich bit. Don't necessarily pick, pick the really species poor bit, but, but choose something that is fairly average for, for that particular margin that you're trying to monitor. Um, also, it's worth mentioning, particularly when it comes to margins, you're likely to have something uh, adjacent to your plot that's gonna be quite characteristic to help you refine your plot in the future. So um, a, a standard hedgerow tree, a gatepost or something like that. Um, try and measure or pace at, um, the distance between that feature and the start or the end of your plot so that it'll help you refine your plot in the future. Um, I've been using um, the What Three Words app. If, if you've got a, um, you know, a snazzy phone, um, the app for that is really good because you if, if anybody hasn't used it before, each um, it gives you three words which represents the grid reference that you're located at. And it's quite good because it's a lot easier to actually write that down because it's just three words that you can read rather than having to check your digits. Um, and not only is it quite accurate in terms of recording where you're located, but also a separate part of the app actually helps you relocate that location again by entering your three words back into the app it will direct you exactly to that location or pretty much to that location so it that could be a really good app not only for monitoring this habitat but um, other habitats too so i've got another question um why might the species composition change an arable field margin from one year to the next there were quite a lot of um, things, features that might be experienced at a given field to, that might uh, change the vegetation that you will find at a given place. Um, can anybody think of anything that might do that? I might need your help again, Sarah. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, weather, soil type, cultivation time. Yeah. Uh, crop rotation. Yeah. Whoa, it's going so fast. Uh, <laughs> um, changes of ploughing, tillage, grass yeah. becoming dominant, climate, management changes, season yeah. planting. 
uh, more or less plant cross crop pests. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Season of cultivation change. Yeah. Different field crops rotation. Yeah. The cultivation um, timing actually as well. So if one field might have been cultivated in spring first year and then you might go again and it was cultivated in autumn. That might make a, a difference or would definitely make a difference actually. Um, also, um, well, sorry, go on. No, yeah, just before you carry on there, Hannah, I just, yeah. um, um, somebody just asked a question in the Q&A that um, I tried to answer and I pressed the wrong button and it, it sort of won't let me answer it now. So just for the sake of Sue Thornton here. Yeah. Um, is, <laughs> she's just answering, uh, do the grid lines include those around the outside of the one kilometre square leading inwards? Um, so I would say I'll answer this one, obviously, Hannah, because it's the um, yeah. MPMS methodology. So um, obviously you don't want to be going out of that one kilometre square. Um, so it's more to do with the internal grid lines if you're wanting a feature to be crossed by it or start by it rather than the outer grid line if that makes sense so i hope i managed to answer your question for you sue and apologies that i didn't manage to do it in the correct way <laughs> right sorry carry on hannah all right no worries um and actually it's not really relevant but another reason why the vegetation might change is because i might have been there spreading seeds we've been in quite a lot of reintroductions recently so i'm leaving a trail of various plants behind me but that's not necessarily um a natural thing. Um, okay, doke. so now I'm just going to go through the um, arable field margin indicators, which are listed in the um, document that you guys are sent. Um, I'm yeah going to go through the positive ones first, generally speaking, and then I'm going to look at the negative indicators um, towards the end. Okay, so I'm going to start with fool's parsley, which is um, a species in the carrot family or in the, um, in the umbellifer family. And so it looks a little bit like um, hedge parsley or carrot or coriander or parsley or anything um, that is within that particular um, plant family. And Falls Parsley's got a really useful little um, helping ID feature. Um, and it has these dangly um, little bracteals here at the um, base of each of the flower cluster. And so that's really useful to help ID when the plant is in flower. Um, the leaves are quite shiny, which is quite characteristic. I think when it's not in flower, the only thing you might get it confused with is hemlock. Um, because it's got the similar kind of um, leaf dissection as that species, but hemlock uh, has got a purple spotty stem, which means that it's quite um, distinctive in terms of identification. So falls parsley is a positive indicator and that's quite a nice one to spot. Um, I'm going to move on to scarlet pimpernel, which I'm guessing vast majority of people will be familiar with, but it's worth noting that scarlet pimpernel um, actually has different colour variations. Um, as you can see from these top photographs, there's um, your kind of classic scarlet scarlet pimpernel. You can also get a blue scarlet pimpernel and there's also like a mauvey version. There are another couple of um, colourful colour forms too. There's like a kind of paley reddy orange colour too, which I see quite often. Um, now that's all well and good, um, but the only other problem is that blue pimpernel also exists and that's quite an uncommon species. So if you find a blue pimpernel, um, the only way to identify whether it's a, a, a blue colour vari variant of the scarlet pimpernel or whether it is an actually proper blue pimpernel is um, you need to look at the margins of the uh, leaf petal, the flower petals under a microscope because it's the number of cells that are present within the, the hairs on the edge of those petals which help you identify what species it is. So if um, you don't have a microscope then or the inclination but you do see a blue one it probably is worth um, if, if you're interested um, it's worth getting in touch with your local BSBI recorder or a, a friend or whoever who you know is um, who was interested in plant identification, because they'd probably be able to tell for you by looking through a microscope at the hairs. So it's just worth noting that that, that the blue pimpernel does exist. Um, a really nice plant overall anyway, they look very similar. The flowers are on these elongated long kind of uh, flower stalks um, and the seed pods are, are circular. And yeah, quite a nice plant to, to see, particularly when you see the different color variants um, in one field. 
So stinking chamomile, um, key ID character, smells like sick. So that's a good one. Um, and I, when I first saw this particular species at a field in Somerset, I remember the person I was with telling me, oh my God, it smells like sick. And I, was, and I smelled it and I was like, oh, that's not too bad, it's okay. Um, a little bit like if anybody's, when anybody went to university or didn't want and happen to drink this somewhere else but if you ever drink snake bite and black it's quite that that sickly kind of smell that's kind of what it reminded me of and um i yeah so at the beginning i was like oh that's okay but by the end of the day it really like oh it really kind of gets you so it's got a kind of a growing yeah a growing kind of unpleasantness anyway so other than the fact it doesn't smell very nice um there are other key features that help you identify it um, and that that it has a warty uh, a warty seed pod. So if you if you happen to look at the seeds, and you can actually find the seeds in the flower when they're not necessarily in seed. If you know what I mean, if you poke around, so you can often see them when they're immature, the seeds. Um, but also, if you uh, ripped the central ye yellow part of the flower into pieces, you would also see that it has scales, um, and these receptacle scales. Um, they're kind of long and thin and spear shapes. So that's quite a characteristic. As you'll see in a second, I'll talk about other lookalikes um, and, and talk about the differences. So stinky chamomile is a really nice one, actually, and that is quite uncommon. So a really interesting species to, to find. I think it's vulnerable um, in the UK. So it's, yeah, it's quite a nice one to spot. Um, so something else that looks very similar to stinking chamomile is scented mayweed. Now, scented mayweed smells aromatic. It's quite nice. It's a bit, um, a bit like chamomile almost. It's you know quite a nice, a nice, pleasant, fruity kind of smell. Um, in contrast to stinking chamomile, it doesn't have a scale. So if you ripped up the central part of the flower head, you wouldn't see any of these little scale features because they're not present. The the seed pod itself has four to five weak ribs on one face of the seed. Um, and also if you poke around, like I said, in um, the receptacle, the, the, the yellow central section of the flower head, um, you would notice that it actually has a hollow section. Um, and that's also a really key feature as well because there is something else that looks very similar again, and that's scentless mayweed. Now scentless mayweed isn't completely scentless. And I was going around on the first year of my well, no, it was before that, but um, smelling them and being like, yeah, but that's that doesn't smell of it. That that smells of something, and that smells everything smells of something. And scentless mayweed still smells very um, a little bit, but it's just ever so slightly aromatic. It's it's less pungent. Um, again, there are no scales present um, if you have a dissection of the flower head, um, and in addition to that, the flower head, uh, the receptacle is actually um, solid, so you don't have a, a, any kind of hole in, in the centre bit. It's worth noting, however, that sometimes you might get maggots or something in, in the middle bit. So if you break it apart to see whether it's solid or hollow, um, you might be a bit confused if there's a tiny hole in there. But it, so have a look for maggots when you're doing it as well, because that can be um, kind of might be able to lead, might lead you down the wrong ID path, if you know what I mean. Um, the the seeds themselves are quite interesting in that they, I think they look a little bit like owls. They have these oil glands um, that, that make them look like they've got eyes. So that's quite a, a different feature um, in comparison to the scented mayweed. Um, now all three of these, so stinking chamomile, scented mayweed and scentless mayweed could all potentially be confused with additional species. Um, one of those is corn chamomile, which is a really uncommon species. And another is Austra um, Austrian chamomile. And um, Austrian chamomile is now often uh, is included within lots of seed mixes. So if you um, order a, like an annual cornfield mix or something from somewhere, it will say that it's got corn chamomile in it, but actually it hasn't got corn chamomile in it. It's got a non-native Austrian chamomile. So if you want to look at um, key features of these species, um, have a look at um, our crib sheet on our website, which I'll show you the link to later. Um, so we've got a really a set of quite good crib sheets actually to help with identification. And there's a good one for the daisy lookalikes. So now moving on to shepherd's purse, which is another positive indicator. Um, it has really characteristic triangular 
heart shaped fruits, um, which can poke out from the plant um, quite you know, obviously. Um, and sometimes the little fruit um, actually kind of balances on its tip. So it's balanced on the, the pointy end of its um, of, of, of itself. Um, so it, yeah, it looks quite, quite interesting. And apparently it's called Shepherd's Purse because in whenever, I don't know, some olden days, um, shepherds used to um, remove the testicles of sheep and then they would make a purse out of it and apparently it looks a little bit like that so that's quite a good way to remember it because it helps you remember the name and it helps you link that to the shape of the seed pod um, the leaves are clasping as well which is quite characteristic so keep yeah and this is a species you're more than likely to find um, as you're hunting around it's not particularly uncommon Sticky mouse is another interesting species. Um, I imagine lots of you are familiar with common mouse ear um, and sticky mouse ear um, is very, very similar actually. And you just kind of um, have to kind of keep your eyes peeled a little bit in that this particular species has sticky glandular hairs. Now glandular hairs are like a normal hair, except for it's got a little blob of um, glandular um, gooiness on the end of it so it often has it has a different the plant often has a slightly different feel it's ever so slightly sticky um so that and common mouse ear the more the commoner species um has a simple hair so it's just a normal hair with no glandular end to it um you'll notice from this photograph that also uh, sticky mouse ear the the flower heads or the flowers are in tighter clusters at the top of the plant, which is actually quite characteristic too. Um, both of them have very similar flowers um, with notched petals. So that superficially they look similar, but once you get your eye in and if you use your hand lens, then you should be able to identify and separate out these two species fairly easily. Small toad flax is a, a really nice little plant. I don't really find it that that, that, that often actually, um, but it's not very rare. It just, I think it's something that just crops up now and again, rather than grow, it doesn't necessarily grow with huge, in a huge abundance in a given field. Um, so it has a snapdragon-like flower, um, which is you know really characteristic. And it has very narrow leaves that are quite sticky. Um, because it also has these glandular hairs. If you look closely to the photograph, you can see that the hairs, they don't, they look a bit more substantial than a classic hair. And, and, and that's kind of just about showing that it's got glandular tips on the ends. So um, that's a really nice species. And I can't remember whether it does the actual Snapdragon um, thing if you squeeze its cheeks in. Some of them do and some of them don't. And I can't remember whether this one does or not. So that's something to test if you happen to find it. But that's a really nice species. Tends to quite like sandy soils, actually. Um, so these possibly fit into my favourites category. Um, so there's two different species of fluellen. Uh, sharp leaf fluellen is the one I'm going to talk about first. Um, so this and this is the slightly more common of the two. Uh, this definitely does do the snapdragon. So it's um, really unique flower uh, with and they both have like a purple and yellow look to them but if you squeeze it on the sides it does the snapdragon open and close thing which is quite nice um now this particular species is very very sprawling and it kind of creeps all over the place it very often grows and then flowers quite late in the year um but you you can find it flowering earlier on but it, you know it can survive quite a long time um, through autumn if the field is left uncultivated and, and left undisturbed and you often find it growing in amongst the stubble after a crop's been harvested too. So the leaves are triangular with an arrow shaped base, a hastate base. So if you can see from the, the kind of topmost leaf you can see that the leaves almost look like a spear in that it's got the lower section kind of points out. Um, so it's got these very very spear shaped leaves. Um, it's very sprawling and scrambling um, I think that the key feature for identifying this species is the fact that the flower stalks are hairless because when these species, both sharp and round leaf fluellum, when they're young, they can be quite difficult to tell in terms of this spear shaped um, leaf bottom um, because obviously sharp leaved has got this, it has the spear shaped leaf and round leaved, as I've shown in a second, is a rounder base. But when they're younger, they have a much similar uh, leaf shape. So the fact that the 
um, you know, I think that something very characteristic, very easy to judge is does that um, flower stalk have lots of hairs on it or not? So, it's, you know, it's quite easy to, to make a decision on that. Um, so that's a really, really nice species. Um, it's, yeah, very, very sweet. And so it's its sibling is round leaf Llewellyn. Now the leaf, as you can see from this photograph, that the whole plant just looks a little bit more hairy actually. Um, this, the topmost leaf that you can see on the photograph has got a rounded base. So obviously that makes that direct comparison from the sharp leaf Llewellyn. Um, it's, I think it has a slightly more upright growth, um, particularly when it's young. So before it gets too crazy. Um, the leaf, the flower stalks are kind of woolly hairy as well, which is really um, characteristic, like I was mentioning. And the flower looks almost a slightly more contrasting in that the purple is a darker purple um, than when you compare it to the sharp leaved Llewellyn. So, and, and this species is just ever so slightly less common than sharp leaved. So yeah, really nice to keep your eye out for both of these. And very nice when you see them both in the same field, actually, so you've got, okay, right, I've got them both now. Fat hen um, is an interesting one. So, you know, I mentioned earlier about sometimes people when they migrated through Europe and into the UK, they brought crops with them that they would obviously want them want to farm. Um, actually, fat hen was brought to the UK as a crop itself, but now it's classified as a weed or an unwanted species or an arable plant. Um, but actually, when when it was first brought, it was you know here because it had it was it was very useful. And in fact, you can actually eat the leaves and stuff. Not that I would suggest that you go eating things just in case you've got the ID wrong. But um, this particular species is um, actually edible. Um, now it's it's not a particularly exciting plant, I would say. But one of the things that I quite like about it is it's very similar to um, the oryx. Um, but when you get your ID and your eyes peeled on them, then it's quite satisfying because you can tell the difference. So I do quite like seeing them just because I could say, oh yeah, I, I know now I remember how to tell those apart. Um, now they can be very variable, which I think is probably one of the things that get a bit frustrating with this species. Um, sometimes they're quite small, but sometimes they can get quite large. Um, now it tends to have a white gray, like mealy surface to the leaf. Um, which is quite characteristic and the leaves are diamond shaped. Um, now I'll mention the mealiness actually because that could help you identify a fat hen or a chenopodium um, versus the oryx. I say oryx, I'm not sure if everybody says orash or h, anyway I say oryx, if you think I've got it wrong I apologise but I'm not exactly sure how to say it. Um, so if you look with a hand lens at the leaf of fat hen and you really zoom into the mealy bits, the bits that are kind of looking dusty, you'll notice that they're all spherical in shape. And if you look at the mealiness of the auric, so the um, common auric or spear leaved auric, um, then you'll notice that the, the mealiness, if you look in real close, they're actually these tiny little things like dusty bits that are actually sausage shaped. So the shape of, of that's different. And as the plant matures for the oryx, they um, tend to, sometimes they're still sausagey, but other than that, sometimes they burst. And so you have this kind of salty kind of crust uh, instead rather than mealiness. So there are ways that you can tell them apart when they're not even in flower, which is really quite good. Particularly if all you need to know is if it's fat hen or not, you know, does it have the spherical mealiness, then yes, yeah, it's, it's fat hen or it's a chenopodium, it's in that group. Um, also, the flowers are different. So you'll notice for the fat hen, this, this the central photograph, the, the flowers are in these ball like clusters um, on the kind of upper parts of the plant. So that's very different. If you look at the bottom right photograph, the um, oryx have um, uh, bracteoles, they have these leaf-like structures. You can see it looks a bit more leafy. Um, so the flower is actually very, very different in these two different groups. So something that you might want to just take your books with you when you first start to identify them, but you're, you should get your eyes in pretty quick. Um, and those key features will help you identify, hopefully, that hen. Um, so spurges are quite cool. They're a bit like the aliens of the plant world, I think. They're just really you know, very, very unique. And they're, they're plants that you wouldn't necessarily get muddled with, with any other group of plant. Um, dwarf spurge, the, the photo on the left, um, is a positive indicator for the um, National Plant Monitoring Scheme. And 
uh, the you'll notice so it has actually can't really see the leaves very clearly but the leaves are narrow um, and untoothed and the the tiny flowers which are very strange looking features I would certainly recommend having a look at your a plant book if you have one and having a look at a spurge up close because they are just very very different to any other um, flowering plant that you have you know in the UK um, and you'll notice that there are these the spikiness of this particular photograph is because there are these um, these long narrow bracts under the flowers um, and that gives the whole plant a really spiky appearance um, and dwarf spurge is quite uncommon actually so if you find that you, the likelihood is you're in quite a nice place and you might find some uncommon species um, and then on the right the right hand side pic picture in fact the, the, the two spurges on the right are actually the same photograph. I just happened to find both petty spurge and sun spurge right next to each other on my allotment and I got a bit excited so I took a photo of them. Um, so sun spurge is another positive indicator and that um, I can kind of see why it's called sun spurge. It's nice and round and it's quite yellowy um, and that's got a really nice distinct rough. If you have a look um, at the base of the, the flower um, at the base of the flower you have like a these umble bracts which looks a bit like a rough it almost um, kind of holds the flower up I hopefully hopefully you can see it. it's like five almost look like five leaves that adjoin at the location where the the flower um, stems come into that central point and um, that's you know quite quite a distinctive feature and then petty spurge the one in the middle is the most common of the three which isn't actually an indicator for your survey so you won't necessarily have to highlight this but it's just worth like um making you know of its existence and it's almost like it's not as showy as the other two and it's a it's a bit um a bit more disappointing to look at which sounds a bit harsh but um it's not as, not as um showy and also it's worth noting that the flower glands again have a look at your books and so you can see what i'm referring to because you can have a look at the diagrams um are different shapes um, and they're actually crescent shaped in petty spurge and they're um they're they're round um in or oval in sun spurge so yeah I'd, I'd recommend having a look in more detail at those when if you if you get a chance and you you know they're very they're fairly common sun spurge and petty spurge are fairly common and petty spurge is the most common of those three um yeah so they're quite quite cool plants um, okay, one more question. Sorry, last question. Um, can you remember any key differences between round leaf flowellen and um, sharp leaf flowellen? And once you thought about that, can you either remember or figure out what particular species this one might be here on the right, the photograph? I'm just waiting for some answers to come in, Hannah. Oh, <laughs> cheers. A few people have had to um, depart just because of um, school run and things. Oh, oh yeah, of course hair on flower stem higher contrast between lipstick colorings sharp no yeah. hairs on the stem leaves are different someone says round yeah uh ee. sharp leaved has hairless flower uh, flowering stems and round leaved has hairy this yeah. one is round um sharp leaved have darker coloring sharp leaf fluen as hairless stem spear leaf shape spear shaped leaves on sharp leaf fluellen sprawling yeah. sharp leaved smooth flowered stalk so sharp leaf fluellen yeah dark purple top lip on flowers of round leaved uh picture the sharp so which one cool. is it yeah so it is sharp leaf fluellen and <laughs> one of the key things is that you can just about make out that the flower stalk is hairless um yeah cool that was good well done <laughs> um Okay, and these definitely fit into my favourites. These are the fumatories and really quite a cool uh, group of plants. I'm not sure if I would be can see my face, but I have thought I'd, brought, I'd just bring in some fumatories that I've been growing because these photographs don't really show the leaves very well. Can you see that, Sarah? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, so the fumatories have got these like very kind of nice dissected leaves and some really quite nice flowers, which hopefully people can just about make out. Um, now, interestingly, these photos are all of different species on 
this slide. Um, so you can kind of tell they look quite similar, but once you get your eye in, you can tell, tell them all apart. Not that you need to for the um, National Plant Monitoring um, surveys, because you just need to highlight whether fumatories are present or not. Um, so the fact that they all, because they all look so similar, then at least it's quite helps you identify the fact that it is a fumatory or not. There's not really anything I don't think you'd muddle with a fumatory, um, but I would certainly recommend looking into these if you start getting into arable plants because they're really quite interesting things. Um, so they have these bracts um, on the side of the flower, which really helps with identification. You often have to measure the size of the bract. Um, and it's worth mentioning actually that fumitri there are two sets really within the fumitries. There's the fumitries and there's the ramping fumitries. Fumitries tend to have flowers that are less than nine millimeters long and ramping fumitries have um, flowers that are over nine millimeters long. So that distinct flower size can help you immediately separate out into one group or another. Fumitries tend to be more common to the east of the UK and ramping fumitries tend to be more common in the west. So that's another kind of pattern that can help. Um, but yeah, a really nice um, um, group of plants. Um, here I've just highlighted a negative indicator and a positive indicator because they're both in the same family. Now, cleavers, otherwise known as sticky willy or goose grass, is the plant that people used to kind of stick onto each, each other's backs. And I don't know, just because that's something that's fun to do as a kid. Um, and it's quite a sprawling, quite a, can grow quite high and it's got white flowers. And it's a plant that I would say most people are familiar with. Field matter, on the other hand, um, hand is a species that is tiny um, very often well, probably doesn't even grow more than five centimeters high um, it sprawls it kind of crawls along the ground it's, you know scrambles along the ground um, it has tiny pink flowers which actually are probably not that much smaller than the flowers you'd find on cleavers um, and the leaves are similar in structure in that they're in whorls but the whorls are four to six um, leaves and they have quite prickly edges and to be honest it probably would stick on a jumper just as well but it's quite small and you don't come across it as much um, so this species quite like sandy soil as well and is a, is a really nice one to to see or at least uh, I think so um, okay corn cool marigold this is a really kind of easy to ID plant, really, a very big yellow um, daisy-like plant. Uh, so it's got, yeah, all yellow, the whole flower's yellow. It has really waxy toothed leaves, which is a really key indicator as well. So that the, the fact that it's got those leaves with that flower means that it's quite easy to identify. Um, and you often find it quite abundantly in a field. Uh, in some situations, it actually is, can be quite um, pest, uh, herbicide tolerant. Um, so you might get some within the crop itself, but in areas that are mist, for example, mist with a sprayer, or maybe you're in an organic field or in a headland or something, this species can become really, really dominant. And you can see just whole fields, swathes of yellow, which is quite cool. So yeah, that's corn marigold, which is actually vulnerable um, in the UK. It's classified as vulnerable in the UK. And another really nice one is henbit dead nettle, which is the photograph on the left. Um, the only thing that could potentially get modelled with, I think, in um, is red dead nettle, which is the photograph on the right. But if you see from the, if you have a look closely at the photo on the left, you can see that the leaves create this kind of rough, this kind of, it goes all the way around the stem. Not many plants actually do that. The leaves kind of, you know, completely surround the stem entirely rather than just having one um, one stalk that kind of comes off the stem. So that's a really key indicator, or I think it's quite a key feature to look at. Um, so yeah, it's got a color. Um, well actually, yeah, they're not leaves, they're leaf-like bracts, but they do look like leaves. Um, and the the nettle, the characteristic -y kind of nettle, dead nettle um, flower is it has a very long corolla tube. So it almost looks like it's kind of um, leaping out of the, the flower a little bit, though not as much as other plants do. But it, yeah, that in, in comparison to the red dead nettle, it looks quite different. So the, the hen bit dead nettles are a really nice one to spot too. And again, you don't really, you know, only really grows in disturbed places. Um, black medic is, an, is another good one. A yellow flowered clover-like plant. So the leaves, 
as it's a you know clo in the clover family, its leaves uh, comprise of three leaflets. Um, and you can tell it apart from lesser trefoil, which is another yellow flowered clover like plant, um, and also from hop trefoil, which is similar ish, in that here the tip of each of the leaf, um, each of the leaflets has a tiny little point that pokes out. Um, known as a mucro. Now, the way to kind of remember which one has the mucro is that, well, in my mind, I've got medics inject. So black medics inject. And so therefore, doctors inject things, therefore black medics inject as well. So that's a, a nice way to remember um, a nice key feature for black medic. Pale persicaria, uh, that's another positive indicator like the others I've mentioned so far. And this is a species that could be potentially confused with red shank. They look superficially similar. But if you, the, the flower is, is paler um, in pale persicaria. In fact, the leaves can be a bit paler too. Um, but the real key indicator is the presence of glandular hairs on the flower stalk. And the best place to look at for this is just under the flower itself. So again, it's a little job for your hand lens to have a look and just see if the hairs have any glandular tips or not. And that can help you instantly identify whether you've got pale persicaria rather than red shank. And this is a species I haven't seen very often. And that might be because I've been visiting uh, sandy soils. So I am guessing that this probably prefers clay, um, calcareous soils or clayey soils. Um, so wild minonet um, is similar in essence, in fact, to weld. So the minonet is on the top left hand side photograph and then weld is bottom right. So superficially you'd be like, oh God, they look exactly the same. But actually the easiest way to tell these two species apart is by looking at the leaves and um, the minonet um, leaves are divided into narrow lobes. So you can see this, the, the leaf, um, the bottom left photograph, the leaves have been a little bit cut into lobes. Wherefore the weld leaf is a simple leaf that hasn't been dissected. Or, um, so the leaves are very different between those species, even though the flowers look very similar. So they're quite easy to tell apart. And, and the wild um, minonet is the one that you are gonna to want to record. Um, wild campion, uh, sorry, not wild campion, white campion uh, is another positive indicator for this survey methodology. And I'm guessing most people would be familiar with red campion. Um, and obviously this is, very, very closely related um, and has a white flower. Uh, the flowers are quite large between two and a half and three centimeters across and the um, and is quite softly hairy. Um, white, interestingly, white campion and red campion can hybridize and you can actually get a pink campion um, as a result of that. Um, the only other thing to think about with white campion is that you might get muddled with some slightly rarer catchflies, for example, such as small flowered catchfly and night flowering catchfly. But both of these species have glandular hairs on part of the plant. Um, small flowered catchfly has much smaller flowers. The flowers tend to be about one centimetre uh, in diameter. And also night flowering catchfly, although the flowers are larger, they tend to sh be curled up in the daytime um, and then they open at night because they're moth pollinated. So actually um, white campion is fairly easy to identify due to that. Um, so uh, tears, um, so hairy tear is actually the positive indicator that you're due to be searching for in your surveys and which is fine but it's worth noting that there are two other species that you might get that muddled with and that is slender tear and smooth tear. Now Smooth tear is actually the least common of the lot, um, but hairy tear and slender tear, um, that's not true actually, sorry, slender tear is the more common, is the least common of the lot. Hairy tear and smooth tear tend to be most, um, the, the more common. Now you can tell hairy tear from the other two because it's got downy pods. So that's quite a simple um, identification feature and actually I've been coming across some hairy tear as I as on a walk just close to my house and you know although we're still in April 
the flowers are out and the pods are just starting to form. So it's not something you might necessarily, you'll have to kind of wait for ages to come across that, you know, they, they tend to flower and fruit quite a lot. Um, now, so that's easy to tell this positive indicator apart. So you say, okay, it's got downy pods, great, it's hairy tear. But actually it's really worth, you know, just as an, an additional bonus is, you know, have you got slender tear, that uncommon species? Now, what you want to do for that, so obviously you've got a hairless pod, but then you want to have a look at the number of seeds in the pod. So does this, the pod have four seeds or does it have five to eight seeds? And that can help you figure out whether you've got, um, smooth tear or slender tear. Unfortunately, I've put vulnerable under the wrong species, so I'm gonna to have to make a change on that one. Um, so it's actually slender tear, which is the most uncommon of, of the lot. Um, Don't worry, Hannah, I get them confused all the time because they <laughs> okay. sound very the same and I can never remember which is the one that's yeah. the right one either. So don't well, there you go, I've put it on the wrong one. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll change that. So, but yeah, so it's definitely worth having a look at if you're interested because you might find something that hasn't been recorded in your particular area before, for example, particularly, you know, the more uncommon species. Um, pansies is, uh, so different, uh, another species to keep your eyes peeled for. So we've got two native pansies that you're likely to find in an arable field. Um, and that is field pansy, which is your positive indicator that you're looking for for this survey. But there's also wild pansy, which is actually more uncommon. So you don't necessarily find it very much. And one thing to try and remember uh, ID wise is that wild pansy, the one you're not necessarily looking for, is its uh, Latin name is Viola tricola. And that's because it has like, or tends to have three distinct colours on the flower. So you've got the purple, the orange and then the paler yellow. Um, wherefore field pansy on the whole tends to have two colours. It has the lighter paler colour and then the, the kind of more orangey central bit. Um, now, unfortunately, they do actually hybridise. So it's worth kind of bearing that in mind. Um, but another feature to look for um, are the sepals. And for field pansy, the petals are shorter than the sepals. And therefore you can see the sepals kind of pointing out from behind the flower. And then in wild pansy, these sepals are far less obvious. You can't see them pointing out from the side. You can just about make a little bit um, pointing out at the top there. Um, so yeah, some key indicators for those, which is quite nice. Um, and now I'm just going to move on to some of the more negative indicators. So the first one I'm going to talk about is black grass. Um, the only species you might get this muddled with is um, marsh foxtail, possibly. It has a similar cylindrical flower head. Now, yeah, which is also like Timothy, I suppose, but Timothy is much more stocky. Um, wherefore, marsh foxtail and um, black grass are, are slightly more similar. Um, now, You'll notice from these images and also from the photos in that black grass, the spike, the flower head tends to narrowly, um, it kind of narrows towards the tip, wherefore the foxtails tends to tend to end slightly more um, abruptly. So they're a bit more blunt tipped. So that's quite a good uh, key indicator between the two. Um, and also black grass really does thrive in um, disturbed habitats. And actually, interestingly, black grass used to be really uncommon. And now it's become more and more common and it's becoming a bit of a nuisance in particularly the eastern part of um, the UK. Um, and it's just kind of slowly migrating west. So I'm sure it will be quite a problem in the future, this particular species. Creeping thistle is another negative um, species for arable field margins. Um, obviously, it is actually quite good for set um, in that it you know, does provide um, a good nectar source with some species, but on the whole, when it starts to dominate, it really um, negatively affects the, the community. Now, creeping thistle is something that most people will probably be able to identify, but uh, some people might get it muddled with other species. So just a quick note in that marsh thistle very often tends to have a purple edging along the edge of the leaf, which is really useful. Um, and also creeping thistle looks like a thistle you're not gonna wanna sit down on, but it doesn't want, look as awful as if you wanted to sit down on a spear thistle leaf. So spear thistle leaves tend to be the most like evil looking ones. Um, and I would say that creeping thistle has this kind of plasticky look too, um, in that 
I don't know if people kind of get that, but maybe because it's ever so shiny, but it, I always feel like it looks a little bit plasticky. Um, and also the stem is unwinged and it's spineless. So some quite good key features there for, for creeping thistle, which is a negative indicator. And perennial south thistle is also a negative indicator. Same thing um, in that it just, when it dominates, it kind of just, because the basal leaves almost kind of smother everything out actually for perennial south thistle. Although it is a negative indicator, it is a really good one to get your eyes in on glandular hairs. So it's one of its really key indicator features, actually, is that if you look just under the flower head, you'll see that um, they've got these amazing yellow glandular hairs, which I think are quite cool. Um, so that's a really key feature for the species. The leaves are very, very shiny. And although they're spiky on the edges, they, they're not like, you could probably sit on it and you wouldn't really notice it too much. They're not, you know, really nasty. Um, so that's a couple of key features for, for this species. Um, for, yeah. Um, south, uh, smooth south thistle, which is also a negative indicator, um, is similar to perennial south thistle, but but different, fairly, you know, pretty easy to tell apart. It de definitely doesn't have these orange, yellowy glandular hairs, as you can see immediately by looking at this photograph. Um, it's similar to prickly south thistle, but it is, the main difference is that the leaves have these pointed bases um, in um, the species in the smooth south thistle, but um, prickly south thistle has uh, rounded bases. So these, these they're called oracles. They're um, much more rounded and, and not so pointy. So, so they're quite easy to tell apart. And also the prickly south thistle is, as you would imagine, much more prickly. And it's one you just wouldn't even want to kind of grab or anything. It just looks like it'd get you. Wherefore the smooth south thistle is um, much kind of more friendly looking. And the last negative indicator that we're going to talk about is uh, common nettle. And again, it's something you think, well, should I really talk about this? But actually, I, I thought it was worth mentioning because um, not many people necessarily know that we've actually got two species of nettle in the UK. We've got common nettle, which everybody's very familiar with. And we've also got small nettle. And it just happens that small nettle is actually a, um, a, a, is actually a, a species of arable fields. And it's actually quite uncommon as well. So it's quite a nice one to see. Now, small nettle, the photograph on the bottom left is, I think is quite a pretty nettle. The leaves look more heavily toothed and they're quite rounded. They're less triangular in shape. Um, unfortunately, small nettle has actually got a nastier sting as well. Um, and it is an annual as well. So um, that's why it kind of thrives or can thrive in arable fields because it's disturbed more regularly. So they're definitely worth keeping your eyes peeled for. And yeah, small nettle's a nice one to spot once you get your eye in. So we've got some useful resources that I was thinking it's worth um, talking about. So the project that I work on is called Colour in the Margins and it's one of 19 back from the brink projects. And as a, so if you look on the on our website, which is a part of the back from the brink website, um, you'll go to our main page. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a yellow bar, which says downloads on it. And if you click on that, you'll just be over, well, probably overwhelmed with the, with the number of resources that we've managed to produce in the last three years. We've got absolutely tons of information, loads of information about um, arable field, yeah, arable um, plant communities, uh, how to manage ar for arable plant communities, the differences in soil type and how that affects plants and things like that. So there's loads of information. But in addition to that, and probably the most useful for you guys is the crib sheets that we've got. Um, so we've got a really good one actually is the flower structure crib. So if you don't want to get overwhelmed with all of the different um, the terms for all the different parts of the plant and you, you know you think, oh God, I can't remember which bits, which bits where and which and and how does that relate to this particular species? We've actually got uh, we've got this crib which shows an image of lots of different flower types and it tells you which bits are which so you you can see um, which are the which where the stamens are um, you know what the petals are for each particular plant what are, what are bracts what are bracteoles all this kind of stuff so that's quite a good one and then we've also got a crop crib 
crop crib, um, which helps you identify the crop. So you might want to make note of that when you're recording management type, for example, when you're carrying out these surveys. So that can help you figure out what, what kind of crop you've got, how to tell the difference between wheat and barley, for example. Um, and then we've got all the different groups. So um, the daisies, arable crib, for example, will have the stinking chamomile, corn chamomile, ostrin chamomile, scentless mayweed, et cetera. So yeah, these might be really useful for you and you can download the, the P, them as PDFs and you could even take them with you um, digitally on your phone if you wanted to. So there's, you know, we've got lots of potentially useful um, information on the website there. Um, yeah, so here's just an example. So there's a bit of our, um, our uh, flower um, identification crib, the first one I talked about, in that it just kind of tells you about, uh, this is just talking about a, a kind of classic flower type, I suppose, and then it might talk about fumitory flowers and various different things. And then this is the part of the field pansy and wild pansy crib, just to help you um, identify the, the different features and, and try and find out which species you've got. Uh, in addition to that, we've also got, well, it's not ours, but um, they're available. You can get hold of the Rare Arable Plants, uh, Rare Arable Flowers app, which is really useful. And it, it has photographs of lots of different species. Um, tends to be focusing on the more uncommon species, though. So not every single species that I've been talking about will be in here. Um, but some of them, some of the some of them will be there and, and also it might help you find out what's what some plants are if, if actually they're really more uncommon so that could be a useful resource as well um, and if you really get into arable plants and this is a great book um, and it's called the um, yeah the arable so arable plants a field guide it's by a really amazing botanist called phil wilson um, and it it highlights um, not only does it kind of go through the the, each species and help you with the identification and also give you information on what habitat it likes or how uncommon it is but also there's a beginning bit which kind of gives you sets the scene really in terms of how farming has changed in the UK since 8,000 years ago and, and how we've got to the position we are today um, so that's a really a really good book so I'd recommend that um, to read as well as use as a resource um, and also I just thought about something earlier um, and that's that if anybody's on Facebook, we have a group that we've set up as a part of the project, which is called um, Arable Seed Swap. And if you're interested in um, growing rare or uncommon species of arable plant, then join the group because we've got um, a thing where we're trying to send seeds around the country so that people can um, enjoy growing uncommon plants and learn about them um, in the hope that they'll get more into arable plants and maybe do some recording. Um, so, but essentially if you want to grow some plants and then keep swapping them with other people, then it's a quite good um, resource for that. And in addition to that, we've got quite a lot of quite experienced botanists who are part of the group. So it might be that you don't know what something is. So you could post a photo up of stuff of a particular plant and um, I'm sure the people would be more than happy to help. So that could be a useful resource too for identification as well as growing your own plants to try and figure this to help with your identification when you're doing your surveys. Um, so yeah, that's it. Finished. Ah, oh, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. We've had lots of people saying the same thing. Um, if you stop sharing for now, Hannah, we'll just try and get through the, I think we've only got a couple of questions that are unanswered at the moment, but I'm sure some more will come in as, as I speak. Um, I've tried to share as many links as possible. I've just shared, um, I've shared the link for the Back to the Brink um, Colour in the Margins website numerous times throughout the chat. Um, I've also just shared the um, uh, link for that Facebook group as well. Cool. This oh, cool. Thank website. you. That should help. So I just made a note of a couple of um, questions I thought you could answer for me or at least attempt to, Hannah. Yeah. Um, so one we got very near the beginning was how long would you say that a seed bank would last? Uh, she says she has a personal interest in this as a hay field that she knows was ploughed a single strip to see what was in the seed bank. A yeah. length of around a quarter of a mile was exposed from December ploughing and by May, nothing except what had been originally turned under had germinated along the whole area. Yeah. Um, so yeah, about how long a seed bank would last with these species in? So yeah, it really does depend. And I suppose, um, so I've been encouraging farmers to put in cultivated margins to try and increase 
the diversity and try and create these lovely species rich margins and sometimes it doesn't quite work out as you're expecting so I was hoping for a really species rich margin and ended up with lots of fat hen which wasn't quite what I was expecting in one location um, and I think it really really depends on previous management so in that instant I think they'd the the grass field that had been there for the last 10 years or so or I can't remember five years had been quite heavily improved and therefore I think that even though the seed bank might have been diverse because the nutrient levels were so high that the fat hen and the, some other species managed that, that, that that was quite a competitive environment for them and so they did really well so although the seed bank might have been really good the conditions weren't necessarily perfect for those for the diverse plants that you might want to have come up um, in the hay meadow um, example I interestingly it kind of depends you know if a, if a field has been grass for a long 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 time then it's less likely you're going to end up with um, an Arab you know a species rich arable community come up um, so a, a lot of it depends on historical management and unfortunately you can't really say from one you know, from one site to another as to what might happen. It's a little bit of a suck it and see thing because actually it might be that if that's cultivated at a different time of year, you, you know, if it's cultivated in spring, you might get different stuff come up. So yeah, it's difficult to say. I do um, know, I do know of um, where I used to live in Warwickshire, um, they were putting in a new relief road um, just outside um, Rugby and where they were putting it, they turned up obviously a lot of the soil and suddenly where they'd laid down the soil up sprang loads and loads of corn marigold that nobody had yeah. sown there it had just been sitting there in the seed bank so again it was I guess just a case of they'd done it at the right time in the right way and the, you know the you know the conditions were perfect so. yeah but then obviously they then didn't manage it going forward for that species so um it, they, they appeared that one year I think yeah. the second year I noticed maybe like literally two or three corn marigolds yeah. but then that was it after that because they yeah. weren't then cultivating the absolutely corn. because then the grass kind of took over and then yeah. they, they need that open environment interesting was it Sally who asked the original question she uh, here, this was an unimproved hay meadow over a sandy soil um it yes, uh, yes, it was. Yeah, so yeah. it's been grassland for 400 years. So because it's been grassland for such a long time, that's probably why you're yeah. not necessarily going to come up with the arable plant community. So, yeah, the best place to try and create a species rich arable plant habitat is a, an arable field that's been arable for a long time or it was arable in the past like a long time ago because then that's when we brought that's when lots of arable was species rich yeah so yeah i'd okay. hopefully answer that question yes but. i think you did so uh just another one saying if you had an area of arable land that was going to be lost to development say housing but yeah. the arable plant margins were going to be preserved and cordoned off from people and dogs yeah. over time would the development negatively affect the arable plant species and plant diversity and if so how can you protect the field margin um i would say the only real reason that it would be negatively affected would be if it wasn't cultivated enough um so you would need the cultivation to be right in order for those plants to keep you know thriving i mean i guess you might say also that you need the pollinators to be there and if you've got a strip of, of species rich margin in amongst a massive housing estate mm. then you know you're kind of it's 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 not necessarily going to be a well-functioning um ecosystem or even part of a well-functioning ecosystem but the plants as long as they can become as long as they're pollinated and as long as the disturbance happens at the right time, then that's then that would be the query as to whether be, when yeah. they say it's been cordoned off, is there a long term management plan to, yeah. plan to recultivate that land to keep yeah. those species going? Because you can't just fence off nature and expect the same species to appear throughout time because no, that's just not how it works. Yeah. yeah. So that would be the fundamental question, I think, more. Yeah and the impact from the direct housing although yeah. i think that's a very valid point about the fact that if it's just a fragmented part of an ecosystem then that in itself isn't sustainable anyway yeah yeah but also that um i suppose another thing is that when it comes to managing arable fields it's not necessarily just do the same thing for every single year and it'll be fine because it might be that you get a weed burden after like you might manage it 
you know okay it's it's cultivated in spring for like five or ten years and then over that time you might get a bit of a weed burden so you might get the species you don't necessarily want so then you might need to to maybe switch it and cultivate it in autumn for a couple of years just to allow for those things you don't necessarily want to be there to kind of you know be sh like got rid of and yeah. then you go back to your normal spring cultivation and then so it's actually if you're in a housing estate and you've got I don't know whoever managing it are they going to actually think about that as something to do they're probably not so I guess the people managing it not having the right knowledge would probably be a limitation yeah yeah I mean I'm lucky enough to live literally around the corner from five heads triple si yeah. arable fields um now even then that they are a plot uh, the four the three or four fields that are purely left and managed for uh, rare arable plants yet they still have issues you know managing certain species that are overtaking and making sure that other species are doing well I mean and that is what they are literally spending the whole time doing so yeah, yeah just it's, it's an incredibly complex set of management requirements yeah um uh lastly uh, just a very quick one I think here about the seed swap Facebook group so unfortunately yeah. somebody is not on Facebook is there any other way that they can be involved in that um the only thing at the moment i suppose is do you have like a color in the margins newsletter or anything um, like that? yeah but the, the, that's not directly linked with the, the seed swap no. so i think the best thing to do is email me and then i can send some seeds okay um, I put your, what's your um your work type email it, address it's hannah.gibbons at rspb.org.uk um but then uh, my job ends in august so so up till yeah. august then <laughs> yeah, up till august it's just yeah um yeah okay brilliant well i think we've got all those questions have been answered that have come in and ever a lot of people have had to uh sort of leave at this point so we've gone just a bit over the hour and a half mark oh, sorry so, no no <laughs> a si a six minutes i think that's fine <laughs> Um, and obviously everyone can catch up if they've missed a bit because um, we're going to be putting it on YouTube tomorrow. So, um, cool. yeah, thank you so much, Hannah. We've really enjoyed it. I know that it's definitely going to help our NPMS um, surveyors get out there and know what they're doing with their arable plots. Cool. So, and hopefully yeah, everybody good. starts to love arable. Woo! Yay, woohoo. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks, everyone. And cool. yeah, speak to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Cool. Cheers, Sarah. Bye.